continuing our uh, intellectual marathon today. I hope uh, you feel inspired and you enjoy uh, our panels. And our next uh, uh, panelist uh, is a guest from France, and that's my uh, honor to uh, present to you our speaker, uh, Olivier Rodin from France, who is the president of the Continental University Business School in Kiev, but he is also an expert member of the National Union of the Political Scientists and member of the Editorial Advisor Board of Questions of Political Science in Russia. Since 2015, he is an expert member of the Academic Center of the uh, Assembly of European Regions in Strasbourg, France. Uh, and also what's very important, he's an auditor of the Institute of National Fire Defense Studies in France. So the floor is yours, and the title of uh, uh, Olivier Vitrine's speech is uh, Pro Putin's Propaganda in the European Union, How to Fight, to fight Against, with the exclamation mark. <laughs> thank you very much. Bonjour. Um, thank you for this invitation to talk about uh, the pro-Putin propaganda in the European Union. Uh, as we saw uh, this morning, the propaganda in France is, uh, and the European Union is very different from the propaganda in, uh, in Russia or in Ukraine. And uh, that's the first point. Um, now, um, maybe I have to present why uh, a Frenchman is now in Ukraine, because when I do uh, an interview, everybody asks me why uh, a Frenchman is in Ukraine. Uh, uh, I arrived in Ukraine uh, more than two years, uh, two years and a half. Um, I was invited by one of my cousins first, and because I have family in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, I came here to build a business school uh, with European norms, and I lost more than one year and a half because of Tabashnik administration. Um, then uh, the revolution arrived very quickly, and I joined uh, my Ukrainian friend. Um, in last time, I had already given some lectures on the European Union in the University in Kiev uh, before the beginning of NEDA. It is therefore natural for me to become an activist. Uh, I spoke several times on the Senate of Maidan. I organized a visit on Maidan of my friend Ari Malos, who is the president of the European Economic and Social Committee in Brussels. And uh, my friend, the president Ari Malos, um, nominated me an uh, advisor for Ukraine uh, to protect me from treats. Uh, because during those time, I had a bodyguard and I was on the treats of Tetrushkin. Then, um, my friend, the president, Ari Malos, nominated me to protect me, his personal advisor, and he sent this uh, nomination to the Embassy of France, the Embassy of the European Union, and to the government of Ukraine to protect me. That was a very, very hard time. And um, why I did Maidan? Uh, yes, I am agree with what uh, I heard here. I just saw from the beginning that my Ukrainian friend fought for the values in which I believe at first. And I have seen next to the Ukrainian flag, the flag of the European Union, my flag. I was, the most of the time, I was most of the time um, at the trade union house in the Arch Quarter. I also went on the independence square. I discussed with the people on barricade. I quickly understood, and I want to underline that, I quickly understood that this revolution was at first a revolution for Ukraine to change the system. And that's very important. More and more, this fight was not only to go to the European Union, not to oppose to Russia by increasingly, this fight was a fight for Ukraine, for a new Ukraine, and that's very important. Because uh, when you see the, the Russian propaganda, they think that uh, the European Union with the USA organized everything. I, uh, I really have to say to you that during Maidan, my friend from the European Union, and my friend was the president of the European Economic and Social Committee, phone to me each day, what's going on, what's going on, can you explain to us what's going on, we don't understand what's going on. And I gave more than uh, 30 reports about the situation in Ukraine to my friend, the president, and he talked about uh, Ukraine with this report to Schulz, to Barroso, to Van der Kumpi. And, but I have to underline, at the beginning, the European Union understood nothing about what's happening. 
that that's really this is amazing to see that the Russian propaganda talk about the compound. No compound. First. Then what we can underline about the Russian propaganda in the European Union. Now, really, the European Union has to face an important and organized Putin propaganda. In this short Cold War, because we are talking about a new Cold War, we have to face a war of communication and efficient and strong. We can see that the Putin administration is using the same instrument in propaganda that during the Soviet Union. And in, in, in France, this is the case. They are lying, manipulating, and using some useful idiot. They are using some useful idiots in foreign country, like they did during the Soviet Union with the communist parties in Europe and all around the world. And now, this is not the communist parties, this is the national parties like Marine Le Pen. But they, they, they use Marine Le Pen and all those uh, persons like useful idiots, like they used uh, the communist party before. And those useful idiots, are really, can I say, really believe in the propaganda and they accept all the lie. Russia now used that party, but Russia is not so powerful that the Soviet Union was. Russia is weak. The Russian army is not a red army. The economy of Russia represents two point 86% of the gross domestic product, GDP, of the whole world. This is figure of 2013. Uh, and this economy is now collapsing because of the sanction against the Putin policy in Ukraine, and also because the inefficiency of an economic system in Russia based on corruption and Soviet culture of management. This is very important to repeat that when you want to fight the uh, Russian propaganda in France. Because they think that Russia is a powerful country as the US. I, I want to underline that a, l a large part of Frenchmen who are in favor of Putin, they really never went to Russia. They don't know the uh, transport in Russia, the hospital in Russia, the nice road in Russia. They believe that Russia is a strong country with a strong GDP like US. That's why you have to underline fact by fact. And that's why I talk about global GDP. And if you want to compare, US plus EU plus Canada plus Australia represents around 46.25% of the gross domestic GDP of the, of the world as figures of 2013. And NATO is still, and for a long time, the most powerful military organization. But if you listen to the uh, Russian propaganda in France, they say that the Russian army is the same as the Red Army, they can, they can send one million paratroops uh, in, in, in the European Union. Believe me, uh, when I talk with some of my friends, they say, if we do something against Russia, they will send paratroops in Paris. Come on, they have to cross Poland and Germany before. But you know, we are in rational, uh, we are in rational propaganda. Then, can we be afraid? No and yes. No, we must not be afraid about the economic power and the military power of Russia because this is nothing in front of NATO, in front of EU, in front of US. But we have to take care about the war of communication made by Putin. Because the target of this war of communication is to divide, and I want to underline that, is to divide the public opinion, at first in the opinion, because Ukraine choose to go to the European Union, and secondly, against USA, because the United States support the choice of Ukraine. Choice of Ukraine. In a Western democracy, the power of the public opinion is taken into cons consideration by the, by the most part of the Western 
politician. Not like in Russia, because in Russia, the authoritarian regime and Putin don't take care of all this. Okay. But in France, you know, in France it's very, very important. We, um, we, are ver we, we, we are very democratic country, democratic people. If uh, we are not agree, if we, we, we fight in the street, we do a revolution, we go on strike, and really the public opinion in France and in Europe is very important, and the politicians have to take care of it. And this propaganda in France and the European Union is here to divide, to divide the opinion. And Putin know that. At Brussels, the Tuesday 19 and Friday 20 of March, to respond to the Putin propaganda, the 28 state member of the European Union took the decision to face and respond to this war of information. European experts will scan the information and messages broadcast by the Russian media about Crimea and Ukraine in particular, and they will answer them and develop a counter-propaganda which would be broadcast in Russia and nearby countries to have Russia speaking to, to uh, Russian speaking minorities. That's very important. That's very important. Now, in March, at least, we are thinking to improve, to develop a strategy against the Russian propaganda in the European Union. We wait one year. One year to, to say maybe we have to do a counter propaganda policy. We lost one year. And Frederica Mogherini, the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and this President of the European Commission, has now to present a strategic action plan. This strategic action plan will serve to support for discussion to develop its counter-propaganda strategy. And this project will be officially presented during the next summit of the chief of state of the European Union in June. To face the Putin propaganda, we do not need to do the propaganda of the European Union. That would be stupid. We need only to present the fact, the fact, the fact, the fact, and the fact. We need to present the result of the Putin policy in economy, in social life, in press freedom, in policy of aggression, etc. Why? Because if you will want to talk with your 10 million citizens, you have to be rational. Rational, rational, rational. For example, I have one of my friends, he's a professor, and very high professor in, in French university. And I say to him, he, he's in favor of Putin policy. I say, okay, you're in favor of Putin policy. Then I think, um, look, look the university and <coughs> look the income <coughs> of the retired a professor of university. <coughs> I say, what? Yes, and they have uh, maybe two or three hundred dollars of income per year, per, per, per month, and you have three thousand, four thousand euros. You, you, you can see the result of the, of the Putin policy. The retired people, they are poor. You are retired from the university, you have five, four or five uh, thousand euros per month, and your colleague in Russia, they have 300, 400. And this is with argument like that, they change their mind. Oh, yes. You, and you say, you go to the hospital in Russia? Uh, no. Please go to the hospital next time. Go and see. You take the train in Russia? I took the train between uh, uh, Ryazan, Moscow, I go to Oms. And you, when you say to, uh, in the conference, I say, you know, when I take a train from Ryazan to Moscow, uh, four hours. When I take a bus in Ryazan, I can see the road. When I, is, I, I, I go to, 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 to Siberia, no road, no transport, only direction. But when you talk like that with fact, in France and in Europe, they understand that something is going wrong in Russia. You talk, 
that's like an African country, they are underdeveloped. Yes, I said they are underdeveloped, but they are, they are nuclear, nuclear weapons. And I talk about this system of the village of Potemkin. You know, now we assist like a new village of Potemkin. That is the, the defile of uh, the 9th of May is a big village of Potemkin. You show your weapon and your weapon and your weapon and what? Can I see your hospital? Can I see your university? Can I see your retired people? Can I go to Siberia in a small village and see? No, but you have a big topol. And this is a village of Potemkin. And when I want to, to, when I do a conference or I interview, because I, I give more than 100 interviews about me down in Ukraine, yeah, and I talk like that. I say, okay, well, and in the mind of the people in France, they question, I question, what, what's going on in Russia? This is a very under, underdeveloped country. When you speak in conference, uh, you have to be really, really, really like that. Fact, fact, fact. In, in you know, um, when the pro-Putin people say that in Russia, Putin is supported than, by more than 80% of the R Russian citizen, I answer this with a simple key uh, point. I answer that Stalin also was supported by a large part of the citizen of the Soviet Union, and after the same citizen supported also Khrushchev and the destinization policy. In Russia, with the Russian mentality, everything can change quickly, depend on the head of the power in the Kremlin. When they talk about complot of the European Union and the USA in the Ukrainian crisis, then I answer them that the real complot I saw was the one to take Crimea and the Donbass. But one of the most powerful arguments is to underline to them that the pro Putin's members are against Russia and against the Russian people. And that's really efficient. I will explain to you. I repeat. One of the most powerful arguments is to underline to them that the pro Putin's members are against Russia and against the Russian people. To be for Putin is to be for underdeveloped Russia with bad transport, bad roads, bad university, and old and inefficient hospitals. To be for Putin is to be for Russia with corruption, prostitution, alcoholism, violence. To be for Putin is to think that the Russian people can only live like slaves under an authoritarian regime like a zombie. To be for Putin is to come back to the past, to the Soviet Union, is to give no future to the new, new generation. To be for Putin is to be to the war in Ukraine and in Europe. And that's really efficient when I speak on interview about that, with this mood, because um, they understand, you know, you have to, to take this Russian propaganda and to send back. And to be against Putin, is to be for Russia and the Russian people, is to be for a change in Russia, to make this country a modern European democratic state, is to be for the new generation of future, to be against Putin, is to be for peace in Ukraine and in Europe. And I use those two arguments in interview. And they are really useful and efficient. To finish, I want to be a little bit optimistic, because you... Um, we did some um, opinion poll uh, in France, and I, uh, we saw that uh, more than 80% of French have a bad opinion of the Russian president. 80%. <coughs> Around 80% of uh, French think that Putin is a treat for Europe and France. And what about the other 20%? The other 20%, they represent nationalist party or extreme left party. Why they are for Putin? Very simple. 
the external right party and external right party, they are against EU, they are against you, they are against NATO, they are against US. And they join their forces and they, they think that Putin can save Europe from US, from NATO, give independence again to France from US. This, this is really a total, you know, um, unrational uh, uh, mentality. But they are only less than 20%. And they are represent the past, not the future. Then, really, uh, the propaganda in France and in Europe is not irrational like we see, saw this morning with, with Ukraine and, and Russia. This is a propaganda that underlines that R Russia is strong. And when you prove that Russia is not strong, this propaganda collapses. For example, I was in Strasbourg, I was invited by an EU US think tank. And they, uh, I was, uh, I was um, here to defend uh, Ukraine against um, a French um, person who represents, uh, can I say, the point of view of Russia and of Putin. And really, I destroyed all the arguments, one by one. And at the end, the Russian delegation and the Frenchmen, they didn't stay after the dinner. Because when they say uh, something, I say, no, this is not true. See that in, in fact, 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 fact. Only by fact we can, in France and in Europe, uh, fight against the Putin propaganda. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your very impressive and uh, uh, deep uh, um, speech. Um, before we'll uh, switch to questions and answer session, uh, I've got two questions to, um, uh, and, and I would uh, ask you to specify two things. First, uh, you've mentioned uh, uh, you define our war in Ukraine as short, cold war. Uh, it's very optimistic, but uh, I'm curious how short do you think this war will be? Um. For me, uh, I, I am a little bit optimistic, I know, but uh, I think the sanction and the economy, um, the sanction uh, will uh, push Russia in a very bad way. And uh, I think when, you know, I, I hope that the Russian people will stop to believe the propaganda when the, they will not. Um, they, they, they will not buy, or they, they, they will um, see that their uh, frigidaire is empty. This is a really uh, image I have, because, okay, the propaganda is well. Okay, you can say you are for a Russian buy, blah, 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 but if tomorrow you cannot pay your car, you cannot rent your apartment, and you cannot go uh, abroad, or you, uh, and you live uh, like a poor, uh, I think that will really stop the efficiency of the Putin propaganda. That's why I am for sanction, sanction, and sanction. And um, that's why uh, um, uh, when I sent report at the beginning and when, when I was on the phone with my friend in Brussels, I said we have to put a maximum of sanction to destroy totally the economy and uh, to make to, to, to push the people in the street. Um, we see people in villages, in Russian villages, so they are already poor and their refrigerators are empty. So sanctions will just influence the upper yeah, we know, but that, that's what uh, that's uh, what we have to do. We have to influence the. Uh, you know, if uh, tomorrow in Saint Petersburg and in Moscow, uh, uh, the people uh, would be against Putin, uh, we would win. We we don't need to to have all Russia. We need only to 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 push some elite and middle class in the street. So according to your predictions, uh, short? How short? Two years? Five years? Ten years? For uh, I um, for me, I think. Quickly, fine. The most quickly will be two or three years, and more around five years, but not five more. years. Yeah. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question to specify another your uh, thesis from your speech is: um, you've stated that uh, um, Putin uh, use, uh, uses so-called useful idiots yeah. in, in foreign countries. 
Can you please um, provide us with some examples of such useful idiots? Uh, this morning, and we they, saw, they yeah, actions. yeah, they they, they they take some some journalist or some uh, intellectual French intellectual, and they 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 pay them or they invite them to to, to talk in an interview, uh, and um, like you know, I think the, the first one is Marine Le Pen, you know. <laughs> Uh, she received uh, uh, some money from Russia, uh, from a bank, and uh, now she 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 <coughs> she, she, she talk. Uh, and she she she, she say anyway that uh, Putin is a, a new general of the world for for all Europe, and um, that's an example of a useful idiot. But also you have an extreme left party like Monsieur Mélenchon. Uh, who is uh, against US, against European Union, and he said that Ukraine uh, uh, doesn't exist, and uh, but he's also a useful idiot, uh, and a lot of examples like that. But uh, they are they are like marginal, you know. They are not. Uh, it's not the best intellectual in, in France. But, but they are still in France, yes. Yes, but uh, come on, uh, uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, in this uh, national party, they represent uh, uh, now uh, around 20 percent, but um, they, 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 they are not. Uh, I say to you that 80 percent of French people think that Putin is a treat for Europe and for France. And we have to be optimistic, but for me, we are in the same way of thinking and same confrontation that we were before with the with the Soviet Union. And um, now I am uh, writing a report uh, for Brussels about Ukraine, and I will present this report in Brussels in a um, few months. And I will have to do a political recommendation. And uh, I will say one point uh, to my uh, EU friends. We have to be very strong because um, I saw that in Brussels and in Paris and in Strasbourg, they are very, very naive about uh, Putin attitude, and uh, and they are. We in my report, in my re political recommendation, I will say, please uh, think like a Siloviki, think like a special agent, and if you think like that you will begin to understand what Putin think. Then that means you can lie, you can manipulate it. You have no law. The only um, issue is to win. And this is the Putin mentality. And in Europe, you know, we take care about a lot of things. And uh, that's good. But we are very naive about what's happening in Russia. And for me, this is the first I uh, think uh, for me who is very important that this mm, we are so naive and um, for example um, when I was on Maidan I said to you that I received a lot of phone call from Brussels from, uh, from uh, my friend President Ali Malos because really uh, at the top level of the Brussels administration they understood nothing nothing and they uh, and they and, and they think that uh, Putin now will stop, and they say no, he will never stop. And they, they think that uh, well, yes, but we have international law. But start to think like EU citizen. International law means nothing. This is for me, uh, you know, very important to underline, and that's why uh, I I stay here. That's why I am involved in this Ukrainian crisis, because I think for me uh, I am a EU activist, I believe in European Union uh, values. I want to stay in Ukraine because I think now Kiev is the town capital of the EU values. And if we uh, lose this war in Ukraine, I think EU will lose definitely its destiny. And uh, that's why I want to win here. That's why I want to fight here because this is a fight for EU values, but also for Russia and for all the European continents. And uh, as I say to my Brussels friend, come on, see what's happening in Ukraine. This is the first time in the history of the EU construction 
that a people is dying for your values. Yeah, that's why uh, a Maidan in Kiev was first uh, called uh, Euromaidan. After the, after the uh, events on Maidan, it was uh, renamed as a Revolution of, Dig of Dignity. And you provided us with the, all those uh, very efficient and essential arguments how to argument with naive uh, Frenchmen to uh, um, force him or her to go to Russia, to take trains, to go to hospital. But uh, for sure it's not a good policy for all, all Frenchmen in the country. And your voice is uh, uh, only one voice uh, to, to perceive and to do so. What do you think Ukrainian media policy should be to uh, open uh, the truth, to open all those facts mentioned facts, facts, facts. How, how you think this policy should be to um, reveal uh, Frenchmen real, uh, real uh, things in Ukraine happening right now here? You know, I, I, give, uh, I give more and more interview for Ukraine Forum, uh, Roman Sky TV, and uh, some other, uh, to really explain that. And some of uh, my interview of Ukraine Forum are, are now in Germany, in France, they, they, they take some part. Uh, and my friend in Brussels asked me to do the, those interviews because uh, they say we need to, to have more and more information. Uh, I think uh, we have to be more active and more reactive. You know? uh, I, this is, we need to do a strategy of offensive strategy. Um, this is really, you, I want to underline this fact, in, in, in France and in Europe, the propaganda is not unrational. The propaganda is uh, here to show that uh, Russia is uh, powerful like a Soviet Union with weapon. If you prove that's not the truth with the fact, that's really you will win. And I, I think uh, the uh, Ukrainian media has to do this policy. The fact, only the fact, go with a camera and go and, and, and do a movie about the train and the transport in Russia. Do a movie about uh, the hospital in Russia. Do a movie about the roads in Russia. Do a movie about the poor people, retired poor people in Russia. Uh, for example, uh, this morning uh, uh, we talk about a small village in Siberia and the, um, the toilet was outside. Uh, if you say that to a Frenchman, say, wow, that was in the, maybe one century ago or 50, 50 years ago. This is impossible to think that for a Frenchman. And if you say to a Frenchman, you, say that, you know that in, in countryside, a lot of uh, toilets are outside the house. Say, What's going on? This is very simple, but if you, if you show that, this, and it, I repeat, we need a rational fact to uh, for to do a contemporary really rational fact only. Thank you for your advice. <laughs> Our journalists probably will do so. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Ilyonov uh, told us uh, that instead of notion media, it's better for us uh, to use another notion informational uh, forces, or even uh, uh, special mission units, informational special uh, units. Uh, how do you think? Um, uh, what uh, what uh, trainings or how uh, in Ukraine we should train our informational forces, uh, let's say, okay. with this term, yes, and uh, how we need to fight with uh, this propaganda, to coin new counter-propaganda or to uh, establish new institute of propaganda uh, to work with uh, this propaganda. I mean, not only to establish some institute like, like uh, uh, Stop Fake uh, by uh, Kim Hill Academy School of Journalism, but also, for example, institute just to uh, explain Ukrainian values uh, for foreign countries, for foreign people, uh, to spread uh, new uh, product, uh, probably another uh, ways. For me, your question is good, but because you, you have, um, I can add I, I, two points. The first point is uh, the organization, and second point, message. Yes, you need to improve like a uh, military organization. And you know, um, for me, uh, my uh, 
training in the Alt Institute of National Defense in France, my training helped me a lot now and during my time. Uh, because I received some courses about <coughs> communication, communication during crisis and, and all that. And that's helped me a lot, really. What does that mean? That means you need to, uh, to do the same. You need to take the, the way of thinking, the organization from the military side to put in the civilian side to do this war of communication. Um, you have to be organized like uh, like an army because this is a war, and you cannot do um, uh, you know very uh, like a, um, like friend and like a non professional. You have you have to organize like team with a uh, with, with team of soldiers who fight in this war of communication and. Um, that's really important because in f you have to um, you have to fight against a country where the army is everywhere and where the special service is everywhere, including the media. And now in Ukraine, you I think you are still a little bit naive in this war of communication. And this is a key point. First, uh, second key point is uh, the message. Yes, you are, we saw that we have a different type of propaganda. You are, we have this unrational propaganda, and this is right, we cannot do a lot of things against unrational, because uh, it's very difficult. But we have to go back on the ground. And for example, can you imagine uh, in France uh, when I say uh, to my colleagues uh, when I, they say that the Russian is powerful, blah blah blah, and, uh, I say, do you know where are the children of uh, the height uh, politician in Russia? They are in U.S. They are in Great Britain and they are in the European Union. And I say, yes, yes. Then. Can you explain to me, uh, if you are a very high-level politician in Russia, why you send your children uh, abroad? And some of those children that are US citizens now, or EU citizens? Why some Russian high representative, they have a passport of EU or, or US and a passport of Russia? And that's really, really efficient in Europe. And you have to do the same the same, and you have also, and this is another key point, to close all the Russian TV channels in Ukraine. Many good advice here. Uh, for sure, a message uh, is a key point in the international war, and probably it's a new era for uh, uh, this notion from McLuhan, that the media is a message. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, we have still uh, 15 minutes for questions from the audience, uh, so please just raise your hand and I will go with the microphone. Um, hello, thank you for your uh, speech. My name is Anna, I'm from the Media Communications Faculty here. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, you say that uh, the main policy, uh, the main strategy Ukrainian media have to do now is to create video and stories about how bad things are in Russia, like trains and villages. But isn't it the same thing that Russia is doing in Ukraine right now? Basically, they publish stories about horrible state of things in Ukraine. So do you think that is an effective strategy? After all, it is being uh, responded at the present moment. And my second question is, what is the strategy for EU to deal with the propaganda, like on a more global level? Thank you. The, the, the first is, uh, for the first question, uh, I think that can be useful, uh, even if, you, uh, if Russia do the, the same now, uh, you have to do the same. You have to present the situation, the economic situation in, in Russia. 
And for me, this is very important because that, th those videos can be used by EU, by US. If you do those videos, th those videos will go all around the world. And please do this video because the video of the Russian propaganda, they go all around the world. And for the, your second question, uh, now they are doing this uh, strategic plan uh, against the Russian propaganda and they will present that uh, on June. Uh, but uh, in EU, we don't want to talk about propaganda. We want to do a strategy on fact, only fact, and that's a very important. Um, I invite you to go to the to the EU website. Uh, they are, they, we are now talking about this uh, strategy. We don't want to do propaganda because uh, we don't need to do propaganda. If we talk about the propaganda, is that we mean that we lie? We have to avoid something. I, 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 I don't want to avoid something about the European Union. I have nothing to avoid. I know we are a rich country, developed country. Nothing to avoid. I only want to present the fact. And the this uh, new strategy want to underline that we will present only the fact and never we will speak about propaganda. Propaganda is not our way of thinking. Our way of thinking is to propose a society and to propose a society is to, to show what is going on in our society. And you do your choice. If you want to live in Russia, go to Russia. If you want to go to European Union, come in European Union, you are welcome. But we don't want to go to Russia. Thank you, Oleg Marfad, from Lviv's Polytechnic. Can I go to Ukraine? Пане Олів'є, дякую за цікаву інформацію і маю до вас таке запитання. Один із... Е... Ага. Один із е... дуже ефективних меседжів, який використовує зараз... ефективних меседжів, які використовує зараз російська пропаганда, це проведення паралелей і, а інколи навіть ототожнення українців і, як вони кажуть, київської влади з нацизмом та фашизмом. Меседж, який працює в Росії, який працює на Донбасі і який спрацював у Криму. Скажіть, будь ласка, наскільки він спрацьовує у Європі? Як європейськ як європейці е, сприймають, ставляться до цього меседжу. Спасибі за відповідь. А до beginning this uh, this message was efficient at the beginning, but now not now. Now no. But at the beginning yes, because at the beginning everybody say uh, the uh, this is a coup d'etat in uh, in in Ukraine uh, some fascist uh, to the poor, but now this is less and less efficient. Uh, and the, first of all, this is less efficient because uh, Marine Le Pen, who is a nationalist party, is with Putin. Uh, can you explain to somebody that uh, the Ukrainians are fascist, but not Putin, and Putin is supported by the Eastern right party? This is, this is impossible. Okay? But now, less and less. Um, now we are in the the propaganda in, in Europe is more than Putin is here to protect Europe against NATO, against US. And that's more efficient than the Nazi or the fascist or something like that. 
And, and, and in France, it's very efficient because France is a very independent country with General de Gaulle, and uh, we were very, very independent. And that, that can be efficient. But as I said, uh, this argument that uh, Putin uh, is here to protect uh, Europe against the NATO and, uh, and US, this argument can be destroyed about, with uh, some example of life in Russia, simple life in Russia. You know, I like to say, if tomorrow I send 50,000 50, French citizens in Moscow, in one week, they will have a revolution. Because a Frenchman cannot support a life of a Russian man in Moscow. Be sure. For example, when I, I was in Ryazan in Moscow, and, uh, I, I go to the administration, but I, I, I wanted to beat those men because they don't respect the citizen. And in France, when in the administration, you don't have respect. A Frenchman, they took the civil servant and they beat him. Because we really are, we are like that. We like equality, we like respect, and for, for I, I say, send 50,000 French men in Moscow and you will have a revolution in one week. We have a once, yes, from our year. Okay, the next question is from our student. Um, thank you, I agree with you on everything you're saying. Uh, my name's Jessica, by the way. I'm with the Media Communications faculty. And my question is about opinion polling, or the opinion polls. Uh, we use, or we say that uh, Putin has uh, more than 80% negative opinion poll, or something. Uh. But how are these, these opinion polls used as a mechanism in the information war? I've been curious about that, even in my own American domestic politics. Uh, but as I see, uh, parties that have uh, stronger negative opinion polls still make impact on domestic levels. So, how we use those uh, opinion? Okay. You know, your question is interesting because uh, the, your question is uh, a parallelism with this uh, strategy we want to put in open union. Because at first we didn't have a strategy and uh, we have a lot of figures, a uh, lot of uh, information, but no strategy. And we uh, didn't use all those information. And really, uh, at the beginning of Maidan, when the Nazi fascist uh, uh, propaganda by, put, by Russia came in Europe, Everybody in Europe say, oh, come on, nobody will, will believe in that. Really, you say, oh, this fucking Russian propaganda. We, we really you say, it's stupid, nobody can believe that. And that's why we took one year to do a strategy. Because at the beginning, I say, come on. Which person can think that Russia is so powerful that you're the union? Nobody. But when the propaganda repeat, repeat, repeat to the opinion, at the end, the opinion believe, you know that. And now we have to use all those arguments. And that's why I say the European Union is very naive, because we took one year, one year, to understand that this fucking propaganda <coughs> is efficient. Uh, I also have a question about how the smaller EU countries and their opposition uh, political parties like Hungary and Greece that are in media uh, presented as being in support of Russian's politics and his power, how do they play a role? Are they strong in the information war that's involved? As somebody who studies media, I am very analytical. I can't, un I can't unteach myself to believe in that propaganda, uh, but... I'm just curious how that impacts on the general societal level in Europe, in the European population. The small country? Uh, Hungary, for specifically, we don't have to say small, we can, I'll just give examples like Hungary, their opposition party, and then also Greece, their opposition party. What's happening over there? Uh, 
you, you know, in Greece, this is uh, this is very interesting because uh, the Greece, Greeks, they uh, one year, one year, yeah, one year before, before, they say that we will leave the European Union, we will leave the eurozone, and they are they, they want to stay in the eurozone, and they want to stay in EU, and for Hungary, this is the same. The, this man uh, in Hungary is uh, like uh, is a populist person, and he talk a lot to this, but this internal policy. But at the end, he he will not do something more than talk, talk, and talk and talk, um, because he need uh, to be in you, and he need to uh, to be in the. Uh, in the uh, eurozone or the uh, euro economy, they they are not they are only talking, they are only talking, and for Greece they are doing a very bad game because they are playing for which EU and they are playing with Russia, and uh, but at the end they need to stay in the EU. That's why I am not very afraid about about uh, about Greece. And uh, you know that Greece represents uh, the GDP of uh, one French department uh, in the Ile de France, in the center, in France. Then that represents nothing for us. This is for us. Uh, Greece is a political issue, not an economical issue. And Putin is using that. But at the end, uh, I am not afraid that uh, Greece will never go to the. Uh, Thread, uh, custom trade union of Raziana Union, they will stay in the, in the open union. I am not afraid about that. Okay, and probably two last questions. Yes, and we'll switch to another panel. Thanks. It's not a question, it's just a, a comment. Um, I think it's a very interesting, This uh, actually, it's very usual. Uh, way to compare economic potentials like GDP, and the GDP is very small, 2% of Russia and so on, compared to 16% in the United States, or 16% in the European Union, it's incomparable, some kind of 15 times larger uh, military potential, and so on and so on. But in this particular area, we are uh, comparing not so much military potentials, or economic potentials, or demographic potentials, we are comparing potentials in information wars. And it's a very different one. Because on one hand, we have uh, information, actually not forces, but troops. It's better maybe to use these uh, troops. I think it's a general kind of, because it could be not only some kind of uh, mainland army, but also air force or navy or whatever. It's just considered um, space mass commandos or whatever. So it's just, we're comparing the size of information troops on both sides, information armies on both sides. And it's in incomparable. Because on one hand, you have a really some kind of divisions, brigades, you have the space mass, you have very trained no, people, know. generals and so on. On the other hand, on the other side, nobody, civilians, unarmed. And they are not able to defend themselves. Not only uh, uh, in Europe, we're now talking about Europe, but in the United States as well, in many other countries. So that is why it's a kind of, it's a wrong way to, to look at this. We need to look, and you're right, you're saying that oh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of information war. Let's compare potential for information wars, military potential in this particular area. And the other uh, very important element, uh, in the war, as we know from the history, uh, not always that person on that side can win the battle who has more troops, but that who has stronger will and actual better understanding of the strategy and tactics. And the, some kind of the, the, the crowd of lions led by sheep can easily be de defeated by crowd of sheep led by lion. If somebody is very persistent in achieving victory in information war and propaganda war, and not only in information war, because information war is just part of hybrid war, and has his will and persistence, and the other part even does not understand what is going around, can be easily defeated. Uh, but uh, yes, you are right. We are uh, we are not organized, and we will be organized with this strategic plan. Um, 
But you know why Russia uh, is organized? Because this is, uh, you know, the heritage of the KGB and of the special forces and that. They, they, they did a propaganda for interior policy, and now they are doing a propaganda for this, uh, for this crisis in Ukraine. Uh, a democracy uh, doesn't, doesn't need a propaganda. That's a key issue. Democracy doesn't need a propaganda to show that it's a democracy and a nice place where everybody wants to live. But uh, uh, you are right. Uh, this is a war of uh, communication, and we are we need a strategy. But I want to deny the fact that if tomorrow the uh, Russian people cannot have uh, uh, all they want, like, uh, and uh, they cannot pay their rent or pay their car or uh, do go to the pay product and uh, to 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 hit. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the war communication will end uh, very quickly. That's why I'm in favor to increase uh, the, the, the sanction. That's why I was in favor to, to, to put Russia uh, away from the SWIFT system, uh, because I think uh, we have to be very strong at the beginning, um, and uh, because we are not at the same level for the communication war, but we, are, we have this economical instrument, and we have to use this economical instrument 100%. And, uh, and if uh, a person has no means, I think he will end the communication war. Uh, if, if I may, sorry, just, but it's, it's look like we are moving to the discussion, but I think it's very important because democracy probably does not necessarily need have a propaganda, a propaganda campaign, yes, but democracy does need resistance and defense. So in a real war, democracy should defend themselves, otherwise it will be defeated. Yeah. Uh, they have been defeated during the Second World War at the initial stage. So that is why ignoring this particular area, ignoring information resistance and information defense, leads to information defeat defeat in information war for democracies uh, by totalitarian or authoritarian regimes that are waging information wars. And uh, addressing these issues of information wars with instruments of economic sanctions or SWIFT and so on is missing the point. That's very important. Sanctions, SWIFT, all others. But they are addressing other targets, economic targets, not the information troops. If we really want to, to defeat information aggressor, we need to address information aggressor, not somebody else. What I want, uh, well, uh, that's, that's a good question. In, in, your, in your logic, logic, yes, in your logic, uh, if I put the, uh, the, logic, the Russian logic and the Putin logic um, more and more, uh, if I think, uh, as you said, at the end, you think that Putin will do a global war? A global war. Do you think that Putin will do a global war? Because uh, really, he is uh, not. With, he will not do global war. He is doing global war. Yes, no. I say with military, uh, military classic aspect. Uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 we are in war. I, I totally agree with that. We are in global war. But uh, if I push your analysis, that means uh, because. I think also that um, this propaganda uh, is uh, preparing, is training the Russian people to go to the war. And, uh, and I think uh, this Russian attitude and the Putin policy will collapse when they will have a military defeat. That's what I think. And uh, now we are only at the first step of this global war. And I, am, I think when I say that in few years, we will have the end of the Putin system. This is because I think the Putin system will collapse because of a military, military defeat. And I say to my uh, European expert friends that in the Donbass, this is the beginning of military defeat. Uh, we are not yet in a global conventional war, but we are already in global hybrid war. In we are already in a global information war. Yeah. 
since democracy are not going to start uh, at this, it looks like at this moment, yeah. a global convention war, but it means that the democracy should have find an answer response to global hybrid war and global information war. Because if today democracy will not respond to information aggression, information aggressive will be winning. So that is why putting aside, please don't mix two different parts, conventional warfare and information, information uh, warfare. Now with information warfare, so we need to re have, we need to find a response to information warfare, putting aside conventional military. And the question is whether it is possible to win information no, war without using conventional warfare against aggressor. This is a question to you. We uh, we will Please, see. one minute because we have uh, our we see, uh, in June. In June, the EU will present its strategic plan to uh, uh, to fight against the Russian propaganda. In June, uh, we will. Uh, in the summit of the con um, European Council, they will show the strategy to fight the Russian propaganda. I think we lost one year because we were, as democracy, very naive. And we were not prepared. But now, the European Union, because of the Baltic State, because the Baltic State asked the European Union to do something, in June, we will present this uh, uh, strategy. Um, but if a European Union with, you know, our GDP, we will invest in a, a war of communication, uh, I think that can be very efficient. Uh, so Ukraine will be waiting for this strategy for sure, uh, to use it in, in our informational war. Uh, Mr. Adrien, thank you for your